so we're going to be talking about deep dive uh, and particularly uh, Rook, um, which is currently a project within CNCF and HFS as an uh, operator. It's a new operator, which is very similar to what CF, but it's designed for a little bit different use cases. So we're going to be talking about that. A little bit about myself. So I'm um, founder of Nixenta. Uh, and CTO. Um, recently, we just sold Nixenda to the DDN. Um, and we gonna, before that, you probably um, Linux, Iskazi. I was a Linux hacker for a very long time. I didn't meet with Linux, but uh, uh, for instance, if you're using iSCSI within Linux kernel, this is what I've done back in 2003, 2004. Um, so, okay. So what is Rook? Uh, Rook is essentially is a orchestrator which is used for uh, in cloud native storage. Um, um, particularly in Kubernetes, and uh, extends Kubernetes with custom types and controllers, which are tailored all for storage and solve storage issues. It automates deployment, um, it uh, does the bootstrapping, uh, automates configuration, provisioning, scaling, upgrading, migration, disaster recovery, monitoring, and resource management. These are all very complex tasks, and um, if if you do this uh, by any other means, you will have to think about uh, essentially re-implementing something which they call Kubernetes. So that's why we kind of leveraging Kubernetes for these purposes. It is also a framework for many storage providers. Uh, it used to be just CF uh, a few years ago. Now these days, it's more than CF. It's obviously uh, EGFS. I'm presenting EGFS. Um, there are other providers, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later. It is hosted by Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and it is totally open source. So, storage on Kubernetes, what is this really? Okay, so this is the example of classic Kubernetes with three nodes, one master, or maybe more than one master for high availability. And then what do we see? We see processor, we, we see networking, we see disks. Um, we saw, okay, so why don't we just consume those workers in the Kubernetes and build up a storage because that's all we need. We need just orchestration. And we want to run our software uh, as essentially uh, pods or stateful sets or something like that and uh, consume the storage devices and provide virtualized uh, software-defined storage on top. So we essentially deploy storage into the cluster itself. So it runs and managed by the Kubernetes. The harness of power of Kubernetes for that. We automated management by smart software. It's a portable abstraction for all our storage needs. Rook is a framework. Uh, in a sense that um, Rook by itself is not a storage data plane. It's uh, just really an orchestrator framework for different providers. Um, for instance, it does this storage resource normalization. It discovers the disks and uh, presents those disks uh, to the provider so they can utilize them. Not necessarily it can be just disks, it could be the other persistent volumes which um, uh, operators can consume. The operator pattern plumbing, so we're leveraging this between the different operators um, and storage op operators. Common policies, specs, logic, this is all we uh, leveraging, testing. And these are the current providers which we have, which is EGFS, CF, CockroachDB, MinIO, NFS, Cassandra, and more to come this year, so watch out. Now, what's in 1.0? And we just recently released 1.0. We announced this at previous KubeCon. Uh, 1.0 has two new operators, which is Apache Cassandra and Nixenta Edge of S. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about Edge of S today. Um, 
And we'll talk about multi-home network as example of usage and what we've done for HFS. Okay, what is HFS really? Uh, first of all, this is Git-like architecture. And I just wanted to give you this uh, snippet from the Git documentation so you can read about this. And you can kind of will better understand how HFS is implementing the storage uh, Within, uh, within the itself. Two, kind of three important points highlighted in red. One is, if two objects are identical, they will have the same SHA. SHA is a fingerprint signature of the data block in Git. How many of you know how Git operates and using Git today? Raise your hand. How many of you knows the Git and uh, using the Git today? Yeah, I'm surprised that there are any people who didn't raise their hands here because Git is ultimately is the widespread uh, source control management system. Why it's so widespread uh, is because it's a fault tolerant and highly scalable system. And we saw that if we build storage system with the same similar architecture in mind, we can achieve uh, enormous fault tolerance and availability. If two objects different, they have different SHA. That's how we essentially detect all sort of uh, errors and corruptions. Um, and then we do automatic self-healing by fetching the data from different sites and regions. NGFS objects always cryptographically self-validated and therefore globally unique. So what that means is it doesn't matter where your uh, data or metadata is located it will always have exactly the same signature. Therefore, I can match this signature and I can do um, global verification of that signature. You can think about uh, benefits of global cache, for instance, right? It's totally immutable storage. You can <laughs> cache it, you don't need to invalidate the cache. Uh, it becomes uh, really scalable at that moment and very fault tolerant. So same as in Git, any modification or strip modification is fully versioned. Essentially, HFS is a system which manages versions. Um, whatever you do with the system, whether it is block device, object uh, file, or noise scale, yes, we support noise scale as well. Any modification to that in instance um, essentially will be Version and those versions is what we managing and those versions is what we distributing across different locations. It is scale out um, system and protocol unified object storage solution. Ultimately, it is object storage solution. It is protocol unified in the sense that it supports different protocols such as NFS, iSCSI. Um, it supports S3, variation of S3, for particularly for edge IoT use cases. And it's uh, most importantly designed for geotransparency and edge IoT use cases. And we're going to talk about this more. All right, so Rook HFS uh, essentially deployed as a Kubernetes operator. So when you see um, your stateful set, you will see, oh, OK, this is your stateful set representing the targets of the storage system. It's a full service lifecycle management. You can install, update, rolling upgrade, uninstall, reinstall. So the whole thing is managed by essentially so-called custom resource definition. Um, if you want to upgrade, you just open your editor, you edit the version, and it goes to the next version. It knows how to upgrade correctly. It will take care of your um, interdependencies, which are complex within the storage system, and it will do the right thing. It is uh, also tightly integrated with Prometheus and Grafana, so you can monitor the behavior of the particular data segment. It is easy of use built-in GUI. That's what we have. Uh, sometimes it is uh, kind of tedious uh, job to go ahead and edit the CRD to change something. So we're sort of providing a GUI wizard which allows us to modify CRD so that you don't need the actual editor to do that. Um, but the editor is good because that's your DevOps style, right? So you can edit the CRD um, and essentially commit this to the 
uh, repository and then have uh, kind of control of what's been changed, the history of the change of your infrastructure. It is runs in embedded environments as well, uh, as well as can be deployed in very large uh, scale environments as well. Uh, it, when it runs in embedded, uh, it can run uh, operate within just one gigabyte of memory and two, two CPU cores. What it does is really consumes locally connected raw disks or directories, and we're actually working on adding uh, a mechanism of collecting persistent volumes as well, like in a cloud, and then present uh, virtualized SDS on top of it. It exposes different data protocols, and one of them, most important one for today, is uh, S3, which is, represents the object access protocol. Additionally, we provide S3X, which is uh, noise-scale abstraction and POSIX-like extension on top of S3. You can do very nice things with S3X. For instance, uh, it outperforms S3 for uh, scenarios like time series databases uh, big table databases by almost 100 to 100 times. Scale out high performance NFS. By, high, by scale out in high performance, this is what really it, it is. Uh, it's going into potentially hundreds of thousands of IOPS. Uh, you can reach a million of IOPS um, if, if necessary. Scale out as SCSI block devices. What it means, um, you can have many block devices in the same segment um, sc uh, scattered across uh, various persistent volumes or just applications. Um, and when you write to one device, it's really going to be leveraging all the disks and servers and zones connected to it. EdgeFS connected data. Um, so the important aspect of EdgeFS that it can connect multiple segments together. And it's not just one. It can be many segments. It can be hundreds, really. And again, if you remember, I talked about Git and how the Git is architected. Very similarly, we do reconciliation of the versions, and eventually we provide fully consistent view of whatever you want to synchronize. Cloud connectivity. What it means is that um, we can actually um, transparently present different object formats um, as internally uh, just metadata um, within the edge of S global namespace. Block level geodeduplication duplication is uh, critically important because it allows us to save quite a bit of the bandwidth um, when we transferring data between the links. Metadata only transfers. So we, because we kind of know uh, the fully consistent representation of all the changes we're making, we can make uh, an assumption that you don't need to transfer this or that particular data block and all we need to do is just transfer metadata only. This is a tremendous savings when you're synchronizing multiple clouds together. Local caching, obviously when you're enabling just metadata, there is no um, uh, data yet, so we basically have local caching mechanism, which allows us to locally cache, uh, then pin, unpin, and clone the data sets. And intelligent prefetching is also part of it. We kind of do not wait for the I.O. Uh, to complete. We're just uh, reading ahead, uh, and that is all built in and transparent to the application. With all that, we're getting to the geotransparency, and it's real geotransparency, where you do not need to think about the data management complexities, you do not need to think about um, snapshot synchronization and stuff like that. It is transparent to the application. And it builds global namespace, really. Um, the protocol transparency is like, for instance, you can um, see the NFS files in S3, and you can see S3 file uh, objects in NFS transparently. And multi-protocol, that means you can actually, from one segment right here, have different protocols, uh, whatever your application needs. A bit more about EGFS cloud connectors and what we do. So, if you, most importantly, once you, when you're talking about cloud, you're talking about uh, object storage, right? So, we're talking about S3 everywhere, transparently syncing regions. 
Metadata only synchronization is critically important with local caching because otherwise you're going to be paying doubles and maybe triples, depends on how many uh, connected sites you have. So we currently support AWS Cloud, uh, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, and Alibaba is also um, recently been added. Um, and most importantly to mention is that it operates with unmodified native objects. So what it means, S3 object in AWS can be seen as OSS object in Alibaba and vice versa. And you can set up synchronization with just metadata so you don't need to move the data actually. Right. So EdgeFS is really a multi-cloud layer with geoscalability, which spans network uh, of geographically distributed sites connected as one global namespace. It's a Git-like architecture with to fault tolerance and immutable version metadata design. It scales equally well for object, file, built-in noise scale, or block devices. It is geo transparency. It is always on. It is bidirectional access to the same S3 bucket or NFS export on a, in a different regions. It's automatic. Uh, uh, last writer wins update strategy for S3 object. So what it means if you, there are two users uh, or applications updating the same S3 object, the last writer will have a preference uh, if versioning is not enabled for that particular bucket. The snap view groups uh, is what we have uh, as a concept for the NFS and iSCSI uh, synchronization. And the geo consistency is what we have the snap view groups, which are literally floating with connected geo namespace. So what does it mean floating? By floating, I meant to say that when I create a snapshot, let's say in one segment, that snapshot is transparently will be available in the other segment. You don't need to send it. You don't need to kind of transform it manually. It just appears on a different segment. Any granularity protection, so we protect files, directories, buckets, logical units, no scale databases. It's all sort of built in into the paradigm of uh, geo consistency. Geo locality and active LRU caching. So what it means is that with EdgeFS, you don't need to worry about latency of access to your data. Your latency is always local. If you have local SSD, your local writes are gonna be with the latency of what SSD provides. Your local reads will be with the latency your local uh, SSD provides. This is critically important for uh, for edge IoT connected devices uh, because the latency is essentially killing uh, the whole idea. An idea is great. Yes, you need to move your computing to the edge, but how would you do that without EdgeFS? So we need EdgeFS. Applications synchronized asynchronously, and that means geographically eventual. Obviously, we cannot break the law of physics. Um, also, there is a latency between different locations. Yes, there is a 5G on the horizon. That's going to be another five years when the 5G is going to be really available for everybody. But even when it's going to be available, you're still going to have problems of sort of like, okay, my link is disconnected. What are I going to do? So how are I going to reconnect? How are I going to resynchronize and so on? So that's why we designed and developed and brought in the edge of it to solve that issue. Use cases to mention. So there are different use cases. I think most important ones are here. The multi-cloud CDN workflow. So obviously it's a classic uh, content delivery network. You avoid full replication. You can do pin on pin of local cache content. It's a conservation of primary source from AWS, Azure, Ababa, and others. Cloud high availability. So cloud can fail your site can fail. So you need automatic failover. You need some failover over the cloud links. So redundancy is critically important. Um, operate in offline mode. So yes, yeah, so link can be disconnected, but the locally we can cache the data up to seven days and then we eventually will be synchronizing. And after synchronization is complete, your data will be exactly consistent as it used to be before. 
Azure ET to and from cloud. So capturing the of edge data in a local cache and provide clouds for AI ML processing is something which S3X protocol was specifically designed. And most importantly, we also do not need to send the data if it is deduplicated. Uh, and if we send, we can uh, essentially guarantee that what we send is necessary to be sent. Now, access global namespace transparently while avoiding the need for full replication is very important for this use case. And because we kind of rooted into the Rook uh, and we started with Kubernetes, we natively supporting persistent volumes across clouds. And it's actually bidirectional, so what it means by leveraging SnapView groups and snapshots, you can provide geotransparent synchronization. Yes, it can use um, just metadata only. And it's, yes, it supports CSI for file and block PVs, and obviously consistency groups. Data segmentation and region awareness um, is also supported, means that um, if you have, let's say, a large Kubernetes cluster and you want most efficient access to the data, our uh, logic will select the closest segment and execute uh, your application on the closest segment. All right, so uh, one of the topic which um, we wanted kind of to talk today about is networking. Um, within the Rook, we're currently leveraging uh, just the pod network, which as you know in Kubernetes is a one big flat network, which is great, right, very easy. So you have 1G, 10G, 25G, 40G, 100G, whatever. This is great, but it is sharing same pod network with a converged application. And this is a problem. When we running applications on the same Kubernetes cluster alongside with storage, you probably want some sort of isolation. So not anymore. What we kind of come up with is a multi-home network. And this concept uh, is when we uh, essentially create a different network for different user-specific purposes. And the network, which essentially are just responsible for Kubernetes servers, API, kubelets, and so on, liveness, readiness, probes, uh, kind of lives here. With that, you can um, essentially attach your application, which needs specific user traffic to certain networking ports will be orchestrated within the same pod right here. If you want to take a look on a definition, uh, an example, how it looks like, like here you see, okay, this is the flannel SDS, and you see there is a Rook GFS namespace for which this network was allocated. We selected Mal Malto CNI for very practical reasons, really, um, and it's just essentially just first um, CNI orchestration which we selected. We're gonna be adding CNI Genie and Meter uh, later. But also why multi-CNI? Because it's backed by Intel. And we know that as far as networking, Intel is probably leading the space. So it makes sense to kind of select multi-CNI. It's a flexible selection of SDNs. You can do not just Flannel, you can do Calico, you can do others, you can do DPDK, you can do SRIV, DPDK, all sort of things you can do with Maltus. It enables namespace isolation. This is an important feature because whatever you define in this namespace will be a network just for this namespace and other pods will never actually be able to get the same IP address from the, this network. So it's totally isolated to the totally different networking devices. Okay, what does it mean for EdgeFS? For EdgeFS, um, from the EdgeFS point of view, it means improved performance characteristics. And we actually have done some work on measuring this. It means improved data security. That means you, if your application and egress and ingress running uh, on a different pod switch network, there is no way they can see what's happening on the back end. And the back end is often shared between various tenants and users, so it's critically important to isolate the application network from the back end network. And this is how it used to be. 
So you see it's just one pod network. And now we kind of transitioning in this particular example to this front end isolation and back end isolation. You can have more than uh, two networks. Uh, it's configurable, it's high, it's flexible, and so on. The other important mechanism here is we, what we gain is improved QoS and SLA. When there is no packets kind of flow, floating from application side, we can better guarantee QoS. It's going to be better response time. So, uh, therefore, it's better SLA agreement uh, when it's isolated here. OK, so the demo setup. This is a very typical demo setup, though in production we're running uh, larger uh, setups than this. Um, here you see four nodes cluster. So it's one, two, three, four hosts. Now, after de the deployment, you will see target pod. Uh, in my example, it was four terabyte each. So it's like we have SSD for uh, sort of metadata uh, offload. We have HDDs, which one terabyte each. So we got one pod, four terabytes, another pod, four terabytes, another pod, four terabytes. And it's really um, a stateful set we're talking about. So this is a stateful set. Additionally, we have S3X deployment. It's a Kubernetes deployment style. So we'll get S3X pod, which will be serving this protocol and connected to the backend and front end. We also have cost bench. It's essentially, it's a workload uh, generator which runs on a separate hosts just to simulate uh, the uh, behavior um, and kind of highlight the fact that with multi-home network, you'll get significantly better uh, uh, parameters. Now, if you take a look on Rook NGFS cluster CRD, typical uh, CRD looks like that. So what do you see here? Okay. So you'll see the name of the cluster. You'll see the namespace. And from the previous slide, you remember that for that namespace, we've done different network. You'll see the image version. So we're selecting 1.20. We'll see the service uh, account for uh, our back and other primitives. You'll see the, the local host directory where AGFS is going to be storing kind of configuration of files uh, of each target. Um, and then you'll see some uh, parameters uh, which are coming from the Rook framework, like, okay, we want to just uh, use all the nodes, all the devices. We dynamically detect all this configuration and building this totally automatically. And some configuration, like uh, we enabled read ahead, we enabled some optimization for performance, metadata float, and some other stuff, and some resource limitations. So when we execute the CRD, uh, Rook operator will notice, OK, so this is EdgeFS. And therefore, it will execute a particular uh, operator uh, implementation, which build up all that for you. So you don't have to edit configuration. It will automatically detect SSDs, automatically detect HDDs, and build most optimal pairs for you. This is essentially all you need to write to get the cluster up and running. And you can play with this if you want after. So here we go. So we have some, we've done some performance analysis. And obviously, uh, as um, I've been expecting, the results were uh, pretty much, I was expecting actually better numbers than this, but it's still quite significant numbers if you think about this. So what do we see here? So better response time. So um, response time is, uh, in case of multi-home, is significantly better by almost 30%. And this is when you're just leveraging one pod network. This is with multi-home network. So you may wonder why there's so many milliseconds. Well, because we have 128 write threads and 256 threads. And obviously, we're bound by the IEO. We have only 16 disks in that system. But I've done this on purpose because I actually wanted to highlight how the system going to be um, uh, essentially uh, behaving with multi threaded application. And the example was it's just two megabyte S3 object transfers, these three synchronous replicas, and six terabyte of random IO data set. So it's, it's a real test case, real use case um, of how system can benefit from multi-homed. 
on IO bandwidth, you will see actually even better numbers. You will see 40% better, better bandwidth with multi-home network versus um, the just pod network. So we can conclude that with multi-home, uh, if we enable multi-home network, we will get significantly better response time and better bandwidth. In addition to other benefits which I highlighted, like uh, better isolation, data security, and, and other benefits. To summarize this uh, brief introduction to Rook HFS, so first of all, Rook community is growing. We adding more providers. So there are a few providers from Red Hat that are, which are coming out. There are a few other independent providers. We improving uh, existing providers. We building kind of uh, new practices how to contribute. And the top contributors I would like to highlight is Abandio, Red Hat, Nixian, WDD, and Suzy. These are the companies, uh, Cloudability, who are essentially putting uh, the efforts into making this better. NGFS is emerging to address multi-cloud and Azure IT needs. We um, added NGFS for the reason because we believe without NGFS or something like that, the edge computing problems, the complex problem for edge computing will not be solved sufficiently and efficiently. So that's why we kind of wanted to, for Kubernetes community, to pay attention for HFS and how this can be used for those sort of use cases. The multi-home network is uh, going to be available in upcoming 1.1 release. Uh, but you also learn that multi-home network can be sig uh, significant in your isolation uh, for the data security purposes, also improving performance. Uh, and it's actually possible to do within the Kubernetes itself without introducing any additional, additional layers or, uh, or custom uh, modifications. So all kind of clean, built in into the Rook, and will be soon available not just for HFS, but also for CF. And thank you very much. So I can accept a few questions. I have three minutes left. If you guys have questions. Architecture. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, I have two questions. One, mm -hmm. <coughs> um, basically, uh, Edge FS provide the S3 and S3X like API, and the, the data is stored in you no know, local disk or blob storage in public cloud. But I think what's the difference between Edge FS and can you compare uh, Edge FS and the me MinIO, I think. So MinIO, yes, so great question, thank you. Uh, MinIO is just object. <coughs> MinIO is simplistic object. It runs on top of kind of uh, directories of uh, and repurposing existing infrastructure. HFS is more kind of enterprise object, so to speak. Uh, it uh, runs at a high performance. It can um, run on top of raw disks, for instance. Uh, and it consumes raw disk without file system. Um, it provides, HFS also provides um, good compatibility with S3 and has additional options such as S3X, uh, which is more designed for sort of um, big table kind of cloud uh, scalability and geotransparency. Additionally, obviously, HFS is a unified protocol. So you have block and NFS, which MinIO doesn't. Yeah. yeah. Another question is about the metadata storage of Edge FS. Uh, I, I, I noticed that you have the LMDB uh, configuration in your yes. configuration, yeah. but I think LMDB is not scalable. So. so we've done a lot of work on LMDB, um, but as far as metadata, metadata is globally scaled out. So each, essentially, it's, there is no like, centralized metadata server. With, it, with this architecture, uh, metadata is, uh, exists on all the pods, so it's gradually distributed. And because we're using the Git architecture, right, so we can address this very easily because it's always immutable. So essentially, it's a sharding across multiple uh, locations, uh, multiple devices. But um, I'm not sure if uh, you, you, you just mean the metadata is, is automatically sharded across every node, but how to guarantee the, the uh, for example, one copy of the metadata is destroyed, or how, how to do the HA? Or? So HFS provides uh, replica counts and a regime encoding. 
which essentially uh, gives you high availability. Okay. Um, so it, it is in addition to the segmented storage paradigm where you can synchronize between the, the clouds. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Is the Edge FS open sourced? So uh, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't have found it in the GitHub or anywhere else. Yeah. So we we have great news. We open sourcing uh, Edge FS within next month or two. So it's coming out. So this is this is very good news for uh, Linux Foundation and community. We also will be working with um, LF Edge community to make it part of LF Edge at some point. So it's getting to the full open source, essentially. OK. Any other questions, guys? Thank you. So with that, I guess we can conclude this session. Thank you very much for coming.